Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of CISO Talk. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'm CTO with TechStrong Group and also analyst with TechStrong Research. And I'm joined by my co-host, or I'm here with my co-host, Jennifer Manella. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm great as always, Mitch. <laughs> I, I'll bet you are. You're always fantastic with lots of good things and ideas to talk about and, and guess. We have a, a new guest today. Um, so I think we're going to explore some of his background because he's done a lot of different things. And I'm really curious to learn about. Uh, so I'll let you introduce Gall. Yeah. Uh, so everybody, we've got Gall today. And I've known Gall not as, I'm going to say this about everybody, probably not as long as I've known you, Mitch, but um, <laughs> I don't know, 10 or 15 years at this point, he's uh, been in the security industry alongside all of us um, and doing some great stuff. Um, I think with a lot of, log visibility and observability. And I see a lot of questions answered. We've had some weird conversations, but Gull's competency tends to kind of tentacle into a lot of different areas. And he's done some pretty cool stuff. Uh, and, I, and I was just saying that on my list of things to do is to find out exactly what Gull does, because I kind of know what Gall knows, but I don't know what he does. And maybe he can't share that. I don't know. So Gall, tell us about it. Well, there's nothing... Uh super uh, secret. I'm just a paranoid guy and I try to keep a bizarrely high profile about me being in the industry, but very low profile about who I work for and what I do for them. Uh, I've gotten better at that more recently. And so uh, I mean, I, I can do the sharing thing, the Dr. Evo, we want to share. So, uh, you know, I'm a consultant. I've literally never had a real job. I've always done just 1099, uh, generally allergic to bureaucracy. So I've always found a good friend who has a prime kind of vehicle to work through. And so I've done work for very large companies, like affectionately called Mega Global Corp, including Fortune 10, um, or some people call them Global 100, where they're just, you know, they count revenues in the billions a day. And then all the way down to very small kind of initial seed capital level, uh, innovative companies in tech, um, highly targeted nonprofits and NGOs, and really anything in the middle. So uh, originally, I started in the physical security world, and I did work as uh, everything from bouncer to bodyguard to kind of community level uh, work. And that's when back when I used to be skinny. So I used to be 6'4", 170, and now I'm about 6'4", 205, pretty lean. But uh, I just that people would come and challenge me uh, when I was working all the time. It was just one of those things. Uh, just be careful about the skinny guys because... They, they have to know how to fight. So one day I was working at this nonprofit and helping them do things. And uh, I called a friend of mine. I, I'll just say, yes, had some boundary issues, but he knew how to do hacking and knew stuff about information security. And I told him, hey, you know, the cable company came over and gave us a new piece of equipment. And he said, oh, OK, turn it over. Tell me what it is. This is before cell phones are a big thing. I just called him on my landline in the late 90s. And um, he said, OK, great. And he hadn't heard from him for a while. And then like maybe a couple months later, he very obviously understood and knew things that he should not have known about who I was going to be working with. Tarmac pickup, like times and dates and locations and mm. activities. And it's like, what in the world is going on here? And so I figured out that he knew things directly because he was probably reading my 15 minute line by line uh, itineraries. And I thought that was both amazing and disturbing because I have responsibilities to people I'm bringing in. And also I want to, you know, leave the gig with the same amount of holes I came in with. Um, it's uh, it's seven per the Ant-Man movie count. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, seven for some people. So the, the idea was uh, he said, okay, well go to your desk at the office and fire up IE at the time and I'd go to 192.168.1.1. And that meant nothing to me. I just had no idea. I said, hey, there's no, I don't know what, it, what this is. It looks like some sort of password protected interface to some device. And he said, uh, yeah, I know. Just type in admin and then admin and then press enter. And, and I quote, and this is what I said, that will never work. Because I was so naive and I was so in my mind already raging that if that did work, how negligent and ridiculously irresponsible would that be 
for a company that I pay money to as an organization would do that to us and to the people we serve in that tri-state community. And of course it did work because he looked it up in various underground forums. And that was the beginning of the end for my physical security career. I was like, I need to understand what this is. This is the future. And that was in the late nineties, early two thousands kind of transition that I made, took a bunch of SANS courses, uh, Stephen Northcutt amazingly probably got sick of me replying to the news bites and telling them, oh, well, if you look at this website and this website is doing public safety wireless network and stuff and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what? Shut up and just be on the news bites. And that was kind of my first big break in the industry. And thank you again, Stephen. That was um, in 2001. Um, and I was just so passionate and active and wanted to contribute uh, Bob Alberti was one of my uh, mentors in information security. Thank you, Bob. He was one of the original creators of the Gopher protocol. Uh, so, you know, just find people that know a lot of things and want to help you out, even if you don't know anything yet. But they, they just need to see that you respect their time and ability and their skills and that you want to be a net contributor to the industry and, and get a good career out of it. So, you know, that's how I kind of got my big breaks. I volunteered or did really low pay jobs for kind of IT admin and security work for nonprofits and stuff like that. Bob helped me uh, spec out and build a, I think it was an open BSD firewall for the nonprofit out of a cannibalized old desktop, like super guerrilla warfare stuff. <laughs> like, yeah, nothing, nothing um, uh, well-funded or formal, but we made it happen. Uh, so over time, those things tend to snowball. And if you're out there um, looking for, for stuff, uh, you know, ideally uh, people will open doors for you. I had a lot of open doors for me that I thought were open, but ended up not being open because when I moved to D.C. in 2002, I didn't have a, one of those TSSEI clearances. And everybody I talked to, because of all the stuff I had been consuming from the open source stuff, assumed that I was already in the community. I know I just wanted to be in the community. But I was not. And so they just said, oh, yeah, send us your clearance paperwork and, and absolutely want to, want to talk to you and hire you. And so I ended up having to kind of forge a very different. Um, Wait, is, that the, is that the 362 page clearance document? Is that the same one? Well, I think that's the 86 is the generic one. And then they, you know, give you all kinds of polygraphs and, you know, talk to your dog walker's cousin or whatever. Yeah. So uh, I didn't have one of those. I, there was no issues barring me from getting one of those. I asked around, but they said that by the time I would get one de novo from start, it would be almost two years. And if I, for any reason, got bounced, they would have just paid me for two years for, to sit around. There are actually farms in DC, virtual farms, where they just give you a thing to do before you actually get your full clearance. And they employ, this is a hilarious kind of uh, a thing. So I, I had some close calls with that. And was, at some point I was like, this is not going to happen. And so I just went in and did uh, work in the uh, uncleared space when, and, and every once in a while, someone from an org would uh, reach out and say, hey, we want to understand what you think about this particular issue. I'd go to a building, sign an NDA. They'd like, you know, ask some questions about generic things. I pretend to not understand what they're talking about and not mention, you know, names or countries. And I'd say it was X, Y, and Z. And I'd say, here's the money, go away. Don't tell anyone. And, and I did. So well, now, that, now that you're not well, now that you're sort of equipped or better skilled at sharing, but not sharing too much about yeah. what you're working on, I'd love to hear more about the kind of projects, the kind of work sure. that you do. Because there's, you know, security is a mile wide and it's a big thing, yeah. right? So many things we can do in that space. Yep. So in the 2000s, I did a lot of work consulting to CISOs as a kind of a consulting slash integrator uh, person where I spent a lot of time on the West Coast looking at new tech companies in the security space and IT space and kind of brought that more kind of east of the Mississippi to the old school Rust Belt and, and the other bigger tech companies that were operating in the East Coast and, and kind of generic like Minneapolis East, if you will. And that was really productive because a lot of people needed that kind of technology, but they just didn't have that uh, bridge, if you will, between uh, the big commercial companies and the small innovative uh, companies on the West Coast. And I'll give you an example. I started working with a small German company, actually, on the other side of the Atlantic. And uh, 
they had absolutely the best uh, full disk encryption. So in 2004, I, I met uh, those folks that are called Udamaco. It's Sophos bought them a while ago. And I thought, you know, especially with uh, SB1386, there are just so many companies and organizations losing laptops. And when the VA hit in 2005 or six, the two years I'd spent knocking on doors saying, hey, you need to encrypt your laptops, you need to encrypt your laptops, you need to encrypt your laptops. And sometimes your, your desktops, so they get stolen too. Um, boom, all that work I'd, I'd done to kind of evangelize that space and, and do small POCs and little pockets of the environments all of a sudden became enterprise deployments. So at G George Washington University, uh, Crazy Trevisani was the CISO there. Fun fact, she was the second CISO there. The first CISO there did not last very long because they didn't understand the .edu culture like she did. And she called me up and said, hey, you know, we need a briefing on this thing because the VA just hit and like the board of the university, the regents told the CTO, who is my boss, how do we make this not happen here? Because the entire VA, lap VA database was downloaded by a GS14 database administrator onto their laptop and it was stolen from their home in Maryland and it was gone. Um, so that precipitated a lot of work on the kind of encryption and, and USB control and other things like that in that space. I also did work with Qualys uh, back in the day when they were a very, very young company. Imagine a SaaS company almost 20 years ago and bringing them to a global 100 old school engineering and manufacturing company and walking them through like, oh, here's their SOC 2, and here's how they do control. Here's how they do uh, tenant encryption. And so they ended up replacing their home-built version of a scanner with a SAS Qualys uh, almost 20 years ago. This is back when Gerhard Eschelbeck was CTO. It's that, that far ago. I remember uh, so you. those are the kinds of things that I was doing. And I also work with, uh, you know, Bruce Schneider's oh, you're team. Making, you're, all of the 20 year olds, you're making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing about that is that these things were not. Fast adopted forward, let's the, pretend like we're young little spring. We're children. absolutely young. Yes. My, my <laughs> hairline is right about here. Not actually here. Totally. I've old. never, you know what? I'm sitting here staring at you because I'm trying to remember how many times I've seen you without a hat and sunglasses. Ah, well. Perhaps we should talk about that at a, sometime today. Yeah, I can count it on one hand. Down. So this is a this is <laughs> yeah. a new look. So this used to be the reverse disguise, and and we'll talk about in a bit about what that was about. So performative privacy art. Uh, but the idea was I could be a bridge between kind of the Silicon Valley or European tech innovators and bring that to the big companies that were really uh, just not able to bridge that gap between the innovative smaller companies in the tech world and their processes and personnel and skill sets. So it was a silly thing to bring, you know, Qualys and a managed service provider together and a uh, full description to a managed service company that was doing walk-in and takeover of server farms and desktop fleets at very large companies. So we put together products and services for those massive enterprises that were their end clients to say, hey, if your laptops or desktop gets stolen, no problem, you know, less reportable issues. We can pre-scan all of your servers before they go on the internet, you know, uh, with, with a workflow. Again, this is almost 20 years ago. Um, we can look at your firewall logs and your IDS logs and, and integrate them into your processes. So that was some of the consulting that I did, but I always felt like I was three, four, five years ahead of the mainstream adoption curve. And that's generally been uh, something that I've been able to bring to my clients is, uh, What's, what's coming in over the horizon and where should we be uh, kind of skating to where the puck is, if you will, for our Canadian friends. Sorry about Gretzky, though. Too soon. <laughs> yeah, one of the things we get talking about, JJ, if this works for you. So in that same time frame when Qualys was going through that, I was in another startup, security startup. And I know one of the toughest lessons for startups then, I'm curious what you find now, is going from putting your product security product or whatever it is uh, in a medium to or small size business is light years away from being able to support an enterprise going into an enterprise. The requirements were so yeah. <laughs> such a greater, the scale went from this big to that big, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a leap yeah. in a single move. And it sounds like that's a lot of what you were doing with Qualys and others and maybe you're still doing. Is that, is that still, do, do startups understand that gap and how to, Process it quicker, more quickly, and get there. Or it's still a learning curve, and everybody sort of learns the hard way. 
uh, to an extent, it's still a learning curve. I think definitely the supply chain and third party risk is much more now formalized and uh, a thing in a lot of procurement departments, you know, or the business buyer, whether it's a CISO or CTO, CIO group, wants this widget or this processing power, big data, whatever in the cloud. And the procurement department, because of the CISO and the GRC and the risk people and the, and the general counsel folks all together said, hey, we're getting owned upstream. We need to understand what's going on here. And also there's just, will these people still be financially available here in the next year or two? And I think this year after kind of the Patagonia Vest recession, uh, some people are calling it, a lot of smaller tech companies just won't survive the downturn. They may not get a bridge round and they'll have to do a lot of M&A which is some other things that I've done is just help uh, both on the buy side and sell side, figure out what are the matches and what are the risks that we're bringing in to the bigger organization, how to reduce those and what are the risks we're buying in and bringing to the organization. So I wasn't consulting on this uh, with Verizon and Yahoo, but an example that is out in the public is Verizon bought Yahoo and Yahoo for reasons uh, unknown to me, possibly didn't disclose that there was a breach. And so, you know, Verizon kind of clawed back, say, a billion dollars as a, as a post-deal haircut. Um, so those are things that are real. Uh, when I was doing VCSO work at a very, very, very large law firm, a very, very large law firm was buying up smaller law firms because a lot of times these companies and consulting and integration uh, grow uh, organically through kind of agglomerating and the smaller companies. And so the moment you announce that, you know, company X is acquiring company Y and company Y gets owned, the your customers and the company wise customers are going to be calling the org the, the buying org CISO and yelling at them. And in some cases that's me, in some cases that's somebody else. But you have to be really careful to understand what you're buying, both financially, obviously with CPAs and, and lawyers, but also uh, some basic cyber due diligence. So given the formality and the rigor and the uh, attention the third party and supply chain stuff is is undergoing today, and I, I don't think it's getting any better. It's going to get worse and more intense. Uh, startup people need to really understand what is it that is a minimum bar that is kind of a threshold of okayness where the buying org is going to approve your stuff. And there are some companies that do kind of passive telemetry around detecting whether you're you have malware out of your network or IP space stuff like that. But I think. Uh, it should go deeper in terms of really understanding what's in the product. How's the SDLC working? Uh, is this already leaked? Is there uh, you know indicators that uh, they're about to get ransomware? Cyber insurance is also now a thing these days, and and this type of process is becoming industrialized. Uh, and I think we're iterating on some good practices and some terrible practices that are going to scale that are just a waste of everybody's time. Um, but that absolutely is a thing that anybody who's in the tech startup world needs to know. And that's part of what I do is VC so work for a lot of tech startups, Series A, uh, even before that, help them get to a SOC 2 really quickly, map security work to compliance points, not the other way around, and then be at the table because I've worn the hat on both sides where I'm on the acquiring org or the selling org and explain, here's where we are, here's where we're going to be, what are your concerns? I'm your security POC if you have any problems. What's amazing to me in um, almost universally now is authentication, strong authentication, MFA, SSO is becoming somewhat of a standard. Sadly, it's uh, you know behind a paywall. If you want to go and shame some orgs, go to SSO.tax. Uh, and I'm, I'm building an SSO.tax version of for the logging world, but because uh, th there's a whole paywall for, for logging, which shouldn't be there, but it is. But the authorization after the authentication. So I know who you are. I know you're coming in from this machine that is ours or some BYD that's been examined some way. But I don't necessarily know how to build an app that is hierarchically administrator where you have administrator and power user and kind of regular user. So many application builders are doing authentication generally correctly through APIs and SDKs with the authentication folks. But the Auth-Z is like this bizarre uh, black hole exotic skill set. Uh, and there are a couple of companies that I started to look at uh, to help uh, with that. Uh, but that is such an interesting kind of a blind spot that I think we're going to see a lot of work in the next few years uh, to catch up because a lot of people are building and selling flat, non hierarchical apps and the buying orgs are starting to say no more. So, Gal, I want to rewind really quickly. Yeah. Uh, and, and pull some of the juiciness out. You said something a second ago, a couple minutes ago, that um, 
kind of what you're doing. And I know you work a lot in integration and, and log management, and you're talking about kind of going to the puck. Sorry. Uh, I, I like skating to where the puck is. That, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So we're going to skate to the puck. I'm kind of curious if you had to pick two things. So if people are listening and they're kind of thinking, um, what are some of these forward thinking applications and, and some ways without, you know, without giving away your secret sauce, are there sure. two things you would kind of share that people can take away of maybe a different way to think about that? Yeah. So before my hockey buddies, uh, get, uh, get, uh, all irate, it's, I believe the term is skating to where the puck will be. So understanding, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but the uh, the idea of um, the, the two biggest things I think that I'm interested in right now is kind of the the AppSec SDLC uh, cloud migration version of security, and all those are to some extent related in terms of the post COVID rearchitecture, zero trust, digital transformation, cloud migration. They're all related to okay, we're not just going to be in a LAN in a building or a set of buildings that we own. We can point to a server rack over there. And there's a VPN and an Active Directory server and stuff like that. The world completely detonated and atomized, especially uh, after COVID in 2020. And so we we're now in year three of that rearchitecture. And there's a lot of people still running old school kind of hybrid multi-cloud. And um, what that means is you have to manage a transition where you are adding net new to the LAN old school protocols, a lot of new skill sets and kind of moving into detecting up the stack. And what that means from a point of view of understanding, let's say, uh, logging and observability, most people in the information security world are most familiar with and most comfortable with logging and observability, if you will, telemetry generation from operating systems and network security. And, and you're an expert in uh, the wireless and network stuff by your book, by the way, it's excellent. Uh, and you're welcome. So, so I think we really need to make it less exotic and more obvious and more common to log up the stack, the databases, the web applications, and all the custom applications. And these things are available to us in freeware and in various services. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, will and skill. We need to log up the stack because most people right now have some good telemetry of their old school LAN, but they just had to throw all this technology over the transom to cloud and SaaS. And there's this lack of skill set and lack of understanding of what can be extracted from the visibility uh, generation tools that are in the cloud. And the, the, the higher up the stack you go from IS to pass to SaaS, the more you have to kind of buy back the control and the visibility, which is back to SSO.tax. And, you know, you have to go, let's say, to GitHub Enterprise to get any logs out of the thing to understand who's in your SDLC. And so I always ask people, you know, have you heard of the CodeCov breach? So that's an example of something that happened in 2021 with kind of an SDLC-oriented breach. So CodeCov was a company that was used by people like Python.org, HashiCorp, and tens of thousands of other orgs and large enterprises um, and kind of tech foundations. And uh, they put a bash script out to say, hey, we use this bash script to upload the code to CodeCov. And then we'll tell you how much of it you got covered in the testing. Problem is that that bash script was in a writable Google bucket and some of you are about to can already sense what's about to unfold here. So a bad guy figured out that they could not just download the script, but also modify it and re-upload it for other people in the code code universe to download and upload their code. So they did indeed modify that. They said, hey, I'm going to add some lines to this bash script to take your code with your IP and your secrets, upload it to CodeCov as expected, but also to my droplet on uh, DigitalOcean. So, okay. That's not cool. So now someone is reading your code and the secrets they're in and is iterating into your SDLC. Do you know even what that looks like, right? Uh, EA Games had a Slack token stolen from a client and replayed against them. And a month later, there's a terabyte of source code on the internet. So these are not necessarily new attacks, but they're so now embedded in the common architecture of post COVID and uh, you know, big companies adopting these technologies that it's really a huge hole around the threat modeling, pen testing, scoping, and all that kind of stuff. So but take yeah, a look at those things and understand. Yeah. Well, I, think so, that I think it's really fascinating where we are is it hasn't necessarily been a big uh, target vector or attack vector, but now developers with phishing, um, 
uh, workflow pipelines and tool change, you know, whether DevOps or others, like you're talking about, it can be as, as basic as scripts that, you know, manage and set up environments, maybe more fancy things like Terraform. But the people creating software are now the targets and the environments that they created in are as a bigger target than, um, I mean, that's the new vector, right? Everybody goes after that. You can talk about the last pass situation. I don't know. That, that, yeah. Yesterday we found out what happened there. Yeah. Right? Fishing to, to developers. Yep. And, uh, you know, we're, we're always in this conversation about developers writing secure applications and how much can they do their own versus working with security people. But now it's the environment, too, that they're building all this in. And the SDLC itself is a target. It's not just the web app with the vulnerabilities that are directly exploitable. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that that's that's uh, absolutely a thing. And so the, when I do work for companies that are developing a product or integrating a product, everybody's a tech company in a way, I look at, I call it the four pillars. So one is the corporate security pillar where you have, you know, I need to comply with regulations. I have legal stuff to do. I have HR. I have laptops. I have desktops. I have servers. I have cloud vendor contracts. Uh, I have uh, SaaS companies that I work with. I have an office, stuff like that. I have employees that I need to do awareness training for, yada, yada, lifecycle management for employees, levers, uh, movers, joiners. Second one is the SDLC itself. What are the tools and processes and people that are building the product? And we saw with LastPass, we saw with uh, CodeCov and many others, something's going on there, possibly a solar winds as well. Third thing is the product security features. It, the, the, the product itself that you're developing and shipping, either through SaaS or a CD with a license key, however it is you're shipping, that product is interacted with and used by your customers. And so they need to have their own understanding of, hey, does this come with SQL injection and cross-site scripting for free? And so we saw with FSISAC doing, you know, BSIM and other things like that around procurement and legal verbiage, and that's great. But also there's some technical security features like authorization, authentication, integration with SSO and MFA, some basic logging, like, hey, do I know if an admin promoted another user to an admin? And then that person who became admin did some really stupid stuff. So activity logging from the people who, could, who are doing things on the back end of the application from the provider side and the front end of the application from the user and admin side. So basic visibility around that. And ironically, that's a lot of times DDoSing the help desk people, especially if you're a B2C company, someone calls and says, hey, you know, I think uh, we got hacked. And if you have good logging and understanding what's going on, well, it turns out that you shared your password for this product with your a relative or your babysitter and you never removed it after that time and it's still there and they actually used it to you know do stuff in your house or in your uh workplace and so the ability to understand really an instrument what's going on on the back end from the support side did we do this and someone inside do this work and in some cases the due diligence is, is prove to us that you didn't touch our tenant because there are logs and we have access directly to the logs for our tenant so those are basic types of things that in theory are not an exotic skill set or exotic request, but in reality, we're seeing the leading wave of that due diligence and requirements from the third pillar of uh, product security features. So when you're selling stuff, you not only have to prove that it's secure from an AppSec point of view, it doesn't come with pre-exploitable bugs, but it has features that are directly usable by your team that is supporting that SaaS application on the cloud and by the users and buyers of your product. So go on. Yeah, oh, sorry, no, finish your fourth, because yeah. I, I have- Yeah, so uh, the fourth pillar is really just like- So many ops, questions. Like running, keeping the lights on, keeping the cloud up, SRE, uh, logging and monitoring, observability, uh, DDoS, IR, you know, uh, SOC and SIM, stuff like that. Okay, so there were a lot of acronyms. <laughs> I, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I've, I've followed most of them. All right. <laughs> I don't work in, in software development. I don't really, I'm not a dev sop, uh, dev sops. I start mashing words together sometimes, you know, I've been up since four, whatever. Um, so I'm not a DevOps person. I'm not a developer. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, so you talked through a couple of examples with some of the, the phishing and the exploits, um, but the other SDLC attack. So um, can you kind of just talk through like, what are some other ways that that can work? Maybe what are, what are three other things that organizations need to focus on? And maybe if, if, um, so I know there's, there's stuff that the 
the organization that they're a tech manufacturer that's creating the product has some things to do. And then maybe there's some stuff um, as well that and uh, somebody consuming that product uh, could you could do to validate. So maybe cover three or four things to spread across those two areas. Sure. Uh, so I think the, the SDLC piece and the product security piece are obviously in iterative, right? There's not like a linear kind of ratchet going from left to right, if you will, because the, you, you get, market and sales and marketing feedback from your prospects and your buyers around what do they want to see in the product. And that's really interesting that you then feed that back into the SPLC with the product manager kind of interacting between those two. And so there are obviously things, you know, OAuth top 10 and other kind of standards out there that are uh, part of the due diligence from the buying process. And the auditors in some cases will ask uh, whether you're getting a certification third party that you can show. Uh, or the auditors from the buying org will force you to kind of put together a, a questionnaire, I call them phone books, of uh, all the things you do around AppSec and secure uh, development. And you know, there are a lot of things involved here. And one of them, as we saw with the, uh, the password manager uh, breach the other day, they uh, said that someone had a, a home laptop, potentially with a media uh, 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 software that some people are theorizing like, it's still Plex. Call it a Plex server. Yeah, it might we be a Plex server. Know. Uh, who knows? Uh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> but that that was exploited, and they use that exploit to put a keylogger on the home machine of the developer. And so I know for a fact that a lot of organizations really want to not necessarily use BYOD and home machines for really sensitive DevOps type of stuff. But there is so much friction between the various orgs, the CISO, the CTO. And, and kind of the speed of development. So it's a natural thing to kind of try to split that baby and say, fine. And there's a lot of privacy and kind of labor activism issues now that we're also seeing around, hey, we're gonna roll out MFA because we're required to and our customers demand it. And also our employees want their HR data safe so they don't get uh, their stuff breached. But we're seeing interesting pushback from some employees or contractors saying, you can't even send me a text on my phone without paying for it or whatever. And, and I've never in the last two years where I started seeing this stuff, seen a general counsel uh, not give up on that stuff. So there's a lot of really, really interesting friction happening around BYD versus corporate devices. And when you couple kind of the uh, labor pushback and I consider myself la you know, labor, like wetware, right? It's supposed to hardware and software. So the labor pushback and the uh, privacy regulations out there between EU and California and you know, going east from there, it's going to become really, really hard to say yes to BYOD without intrusive privacy impacting uh, tools. And some of that is, you know, mobile application management versus device management and so on, a little containers. But that starts getting into, well, what can you see? What can you do? And there was a huge Twitter blow up uh, a week or two ago around a university a PhD student in computer science at an Ivy League school that said, how dare you put an EDR on my machine in my uh, lab? Mm -hmm. And you know, what about the privacy implications and academic freedom? And so we're still having this debate. And I think it's going to be around for a while around where is the balance between this is a corporate laptop. You have no expectation of privacy. You can see practically everything. Don't do any stupid stuff on here and don't do anything that you don't want us to know about. And so yes. I, I, I generally want to Tell people, start thinking about entirely cleaving BYOD from uh, corporate devices, except for like checking a calendar or something really uh, benign from a uh, mobile application management uh, container. That, that's something I'm absolutely seeing as a, a thing that people are not ready to deal with. And they're stepping on that landmine over and over. Yeah. And it's interesting that we took a BYOD turn here because this is something... I, I personally feel passionate about. Um, I started speaking on BYOD and, and helping clients, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago when we had the whole consumerization of IT, right, right. Um, you know, whole blow up then. And I feel like we never really got out of that. We just sort of no. started ignoring it. No. Um, and it's interesting. So since you, since you pitched my book there, I will tell you, and I think Mitch, we can probably maybe even give away a book if we want to do that. Um, there is actually a whole section in the book um, around BYOD that addresses not just the technical controls, but the legal considerations and implications. And there's actually a couple of case studies I call out in the book to kind of give an example to, to that, because I think in a lot of organizations, nobody, the architects 
and the operational teams, as well as the executive leadership really don't have their heads wrapped around what that means. Mm -hmm. And it is so, you know, what you can and can't do and the legal ramifications of that are very geographic or regionally specific. So, you know, within the U S there's, there's kind of some big umbrellas, we, you know, and some sweeping statements we can make outside the U S So, you know, I'm, I'm learning because most of my work um, is in the U S it's certainly in North America. Um, so, you know, learning kind of some of these rules and regulations in other countries and what Europe does and how they handle things, it's been really, really eye-opening. And actually, since we're golf, because we're both IONS faculty, one of the yep. trainings I'm doing for IONS coming up is a BYOD training, like planning Excellent. and securing BYOD, which covers all of the legal stuff. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer, but, um, yep. but yeah, it's crazy because to to really tentacle into all of the different paths from a personal device that may not have direct access into a resource, but if you can hop through it and, you know, it's easy for me as not a software person to kind of balk at, you know, how, how could you, how could a company uh-huh. of that size with only a handful of people with, with that level of, of access, how could they have not been paying better attention and better secured that? Uh-huh. Because I think there will be a lot of friction telling people you've got to carry two phones around just to check your mail. But my God, if you have, you know, the entire, the entire, de- you know, decryption suite for a, a vault of, of your customer's information, certainly that warrants a little, a little bit of extra attention. And I, again, I know I'm sitting back, yeah. you know, back here in the, you know, I don't the, the glass house thing. I don't I don't know enough about that that world, but I just have to imagine that we could we could do better. Well, let, let me interject this because because I do come from that world too. It, you know the, the the clash, if you want to call it a culture clash or whatever, with the right with the whole digital transformation, the rise of software and the importance going from back room and back office activities to really a forefront strategic part of running almost every business. Yeah. And I'm sure you see that call is with that is we've also what we call the democratization of software, meaning developers drive a lot of technology decisions. It's an entree point for open source and products and all kinds of things that maybe in, in, in large, some large enterprises, you know, more regulated are under more control. A lot of organizations, it's developer fed into the organization and then it kind of gets formalized and adopted at some point. But it it has been anyway for the last probably two three years. The higher developers, you know, they pick you based on the tools and the flexibility and the environment and the kind of work they're yep. going to do. And if you said if you said you will have to use a corporate laptop that has this installed in it, they'd move on to the next job applicant. Not yeah. even it's it's absolutely it's, a, a it's, culture it's, and a, it's a conflict. I mean, yeah, it's a big deal. Uh, and Jamil Farshi. Uh, I saw him give a talk in DC years ago. Now he talked about culture as a competitive weapon to recruiting and retaining uh, security talent and other IT uh, important people that are driving your business. And that's absolutely a balancing act. And uh, it's really tough between the CISO and CTO, and in some cases the CIO kind of doing the keeping lights on uh, organizations to do that. Luckily there are a lot of, better tools and better processes now and visibility is where it really starts in terms of what what can we see and understand uh, in terms of uh, kind of uh, things that just don't look right. Uh, you don't know what that looks like unless you uh, turn those logs on, if they're even turn onable. And we talked about a little bit earlier on in terms of how do we get the telemetry out? Sometimes you have to buy it back uh, from the SaaS company uh, by going full kind of E5 or you know enterprise version. And sometimes you have to instrument your own applications. Uh, and all those things are difficult to justify and to do. They cost a lot of money. Yeah, we're just, a, just, I'm sorry, go ahead, JJ. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, you know, we, t- we talked to Dan Glass on an episode not, not too long ago, and he kind of talked about um, that. And he said this, not me. So nobody, nobody like, <laughs> nobody be hating on me for this. Don't hate me on but the, 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 you know, the developers are kind of like divas sometimes. And, you know, like if you walk into a hospital, maybe the doctors have expectations. If you walk into a university, the professors have expectations. But at some point, it's like if the two-year-old is screaming for ice cream, sometimes you just say no. 
and you send them to their room, right? That, no, that is uh, that is how security gets in trouble, and that is why Chrissy <laughs> was the second CISO at UW. I, I feel your pain and I feel your frustration because we are instinctively protective. We want to help. We want to explain and understand. But a lot of times that comes across as condescending or being a security Nazi or the CEO. No. And it's really just a layer eight political discussion around what is the best way to balance prevention, mitigation and detection and response. And there's a lot of compromising and kind of horse trading going on. And I, I have not cracked that code fully. I've been in a lot of those conversations. Uh, and in some cases I've wanted to say, in some cases did say, I told you so in a politically correct way. Uh, but it, it is, it is not, no, I, it is I can't, not, I'm sorry. I, I can't, can't imagine. You can't imagine. Yeah. No, no. I try. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's still a tough issue. And I think it will be for a while. Although I do think the telemetry that is available out there and the processes and tools are starting to integrate some of these workflow and observability uh, processes that allow us to mitigate the impact of a single change, ideally a, a initial access on a single desktop, initial access on a single server in the perimeter. Uh, those are the types of things we really want to look at is understand mistakes will be made and um, what does it mean to really uh, do good risk management around that. And, and uh, that at the end of the day is good layer eight, looking at case studies, relevant to an org that is of similar size and scale and maybe the same sector as the, the org you're advocating for uh, security and stuff like that. So a lot of layer eight considerations, but you do need to understand uh, some of the technical workflow uh, and, and kind of the what are people in the trenches doing to keep the business alive. I mean, I did a, a, a thing in, in Hollywood uh, in 2017. I went to Hollywood, literally a Hollywood and shadowed people in a kind of nondescript building for uh, three days and just took a lot of notes. And I saw people getting hand delivered with a secure courier, you know, unwatermarked full HD versions of billion dollar pre-release movies. And the people in that building would take that, put it in a server, and then physically allow people to watch the movie. And there was a guy there whose job was to watch the movie and then score the trailer to kind of hook you in emotionally with the right bass and the drums and the piano music to get you to keep watching that trailer after the first three to five seconds. That's an art and a science. This person had been doing this for decades and I was blown away. This person needed... YouTube and other internet-based services to kind of jog his memory. And who am I to tell that person no? So we have to find a technical workaround between the laptop that is consuming the billion dollar asset and the laptop that is jogging the memory. So you, but you really have to understand what is this person doing and how are they doing it? Sometimes you're literally just watching over their shoulder asking questions, documenting processes, stuff like that. So it's, it's again, layer eight and, and empathy and understanding of, of where they're coming from. That's a, that's a very nice way to wrap up. <laughs> I pretend. Yeah. You, I did not expect you to be nicer than I am, Gal, but maybe you are. <laughs> maybe you are. I'm working on it. <laughs> he's but been I, on I'm, software people he's seen the rejection <laughs> yeah uh, but you know i even i got a few takeaways here um not not working in this space but i think this is you know been an interesting i think the the what do they call it the the monday morning quarterback like looking back on things we have opportunities to look yep. at what those indicators are do a better job with the with the telemetry coming in do a better job you know, triggering and bubbling up those alerts, getting the data from enough places and correlating them in the right way to to get that visibility. Um, and I, this is one of those things where I'm, I think we'll all look back and see meaningful opportunity because I imagine a lot of companies are dealing with this versus I think a lot of times like these weird one off things happen. And then we spend a lot of energy trying to figure out, you know, how to prevent what was the uh, the, the marathon bomber that used the uh, the pressure cooker, oh, the, the pressure cooker, right? Yeah. Like, okay, 
that was a one-time thing and you can't just stop selling pressure cookers. So, you know, I think this though is something meaningful we can look back on. And um, this is a great conversation. So thanks for sharing your knowledge with us and the four pillars and I'll um, hand it back over to Mitch. Thanks for having me. And Ned, my thanks as well, Gall, for joining us. How do you say your last name? So we know. Sponsor. Sponsor. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in getting a copy of JJ's book. Oh, yeah, I uh, have one. We will do a drawing for one if you want to hold up a promo over the book. There you go. It's it's beefy. It's got some great stuff. Adrian, Adrian Snobbia called it a tome. A tome. But it, it's good. It's good, juicy stuff. It's good stuff. Send an email to CISO Talk at textrongroup.com and we will randomly select a winner to get a uh, copy of the book. So look forward to it. Hey, Gal, thank you so much. JJ, always fun. Uh, we could talk about this topic for five hours for me, but <laughs> it's, it's, what's interesting to me is that we're now talking about it and that's, you know, it's, it's been a destiny we have been colliding towards and it's now occurring. So it's fascinating to, to, be part of that. So thanks again. We will see everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us for today, today's uh, CISO talk. We will see you on another episode. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Cheers.